I'm uh, Wouter Den Haan. I'm a professor here at the LSE. And uh, it's my job to introduce our uh, guest of uh, honor, our speaker of honor for this evening. Uh, but before I do so, I'd like to make a couple announcements. Uh, I'd like to ask you to turn off your mobile phone. I always do that. And uh, it still doesn't always work. And so that's so embarrassing if it, uh, it does go off. Uh, for those of you who, who are into Twitter, there is a hashtag, which is LSE Rice, the last name of, uh, of Ricardo. If technology doesn't let us down, then a video podcast of this evening's lecture should appear on the LSE events page. And then Ricardo will give a lecture, and then after that, there will be some time for Q&A. Uh, the important part of my job is to, uh, to introduce a speaker. Now, I do this quite often, and I always say it's a pleasure to do so, and I usually mean it. <coughs> <laughs> but I think this evening I, I really, really, uh, truly mean it. And um, I think uh, I speak for many constituents at uh, the LSE, students and uh, faculty and staff, is that we, we're absolutely delighted that we uh, managed to get uh, Ricardo join the, uh, the LSE. Uh, he got a PhD at Harvard, then he went to Princeton, and then he was at Columbia, and then when we heard that he was thinking about co coming back to Europe, this is that we went all out and we thought, you know, we have to get him at LSE, and we're, we're incredibly uh, happy that we succeeded in doing so. Ricardo is not only an incredible teacher and a superb researcher, he's, he's one of these academics, and you used to have a lot more of them, but over uh, yeah, the last couple decades is that they've become very rare is academics who also understand policy work, who understand in institutions, and can, who can explain to policymakers you know, why academic research can be useful. <coughs> and so it's no surprise right, that he's on uh, advising committees of several policy institutes like the Bank of England, the Bank of France, um, and the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, and I think he's part of an uh, advisory group to the Portuguese president, and I think there's a whole bunch more. Um, <clears throat> now, this actually is not just a lecture, it's the inaugural uh, speech because he is the first A.W. Phillips professor. And William Phillips was a professor here at the LSE, uh, and we are very proud of, uh, of him. He, he also was an, uh, you know, a superb academic. Uh, he is well known for the Phillips curve, and actually Chris Pissaridis, our current colleague and Nobel Prize winner, part of you know, his contribution was to come up with a solid theoretical framework to explain this empirical relationship, the Phillips curve, this negative relationship between the unemployment rate and, uh, and vacancies. But um, William Phillips, he did a lot more. He's also one of the first to actually build a computer model. And it's not the kind of computer model that we work with these days. It was something very big and it had like water flowing from different compartments. And if you want to be entertained, you should just Google Philips machine. And it's, you, know, you, you see one of the first breakthroughs in, uh, in, in macroeconomics. <clears throat> he wasn't only you know, a, an exceptional academic, he also was an extra, extraordinary person. He, uh, he was a prisoner of war during the Second World War in the former Dutch Indies. Uh, he was an engineer by training, at, but in this prisoner of war camp, he built like a secret radio and a water boiler so they could make tea. And so we're very proud of this legacy that LSE has, is that we had you know, these incredibly you know, innovative, you know, uh, smart people uh, as part of our faculty. And uh, we're equally you know, proud that Ricardo is the first A.W. Phillips professor. So please join me in welcoming us. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. It's really a great honor and privilege for me to be here to give this inaugural Phillips Chair Lecture, and so much so that I decided to put Mr. Phillips' picture on the first slide so you know what he looked like. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm especially happy to see so many students in the room, given that it's exam time. Um, when I go home tonight, I'll be thinking, oh, it's so great that they took a break because so that they could see how, given this is a research lecture, on how what they've been learning in class is being used to discuss things and to think about research. And I'll be interpreting your many nods and 
movements of head as saying, oh, they're really getting it and they're really excited about this. But uh, luckily, or maybe unluckily, my wife decided to come as well, and so I'm sure on the way home she'll tell me that actually you, you, were, you just came so that you could uh, not look at a computer for another 10 minutes, but rather see some human faces and that the nodding is falling asleep. Um, so on, with that in mind, happy dreams. We're going to be talking about, I'll be talking about um, central banking and in particular what the new conventional central bank is. Um, let me see what's the best way to do this. So the title of this, the title of this talk, the new conventional, really draws on what, what I think the main major debate in monetary policy is today. And that is very well reflected by the fact that at, the, at its that is swearing in the new chairman of the Federal Reserve just a few months ago, aside from saying the things that everyone always says at, the, at these ceremonies, the only thing of any substance that he said, I think it's fair to say, is the sentence that I put there, that is that right now his mandate is to gradually normalize policy, with a view to make the world a better place, of course. Okay. What does that mean, though? What does it mean to search for normality? Well, to start with, it's a popular view. You can find it in newspaper columns. You can find it among few policy makers that are not in monetary policy, although are about to be. You can find it among the IMF that is across the world and across different policy institutions. Normalization is the key new word, is what you're supposed to aim for, is what you want. But what does that mean? What is normal? What do we mean when we say that monetary policy should be normal? Well, that's a difficult question, or at least it seems like all of these people agree on what that is, or at least whenever one of them speaks, the others in the audience just shake their head as if, yes, of course, we should be normal. But if you think of normal as being what something was at its origin, is what normal is that you go back to the purity, if you want to go back to some of the natural philosophers of a few centuries ago, that what is natural is whatever was at birth before you were polluted by the world and its different circumstances, you can go back to the history of the major central banks in the world. The Bank of England was one of the very first to be founded in 1694 by John Montague, having had as its, um, uh, Charles Montague, I'm sorry, having had as its first governor, John Hublon. And its main goal when it was created was created in order to issue public debt following a war with France and many others that followed. That is, the origin of the Bank of England was to issue debt, and 100 years later, it was even inscribed in its mandate that its goal was to manage the national debt. There was no mentioning a bank was seen as simply a way to borrow, a way to issue debt, and a way to manage debt. If you move a few years later, the Bank of France was created, at the time the Banque Générale in 1716, following the ideas of the Scottish thinker John Law, who had this great idea, which is he realized, well, this banking business, which has been going on for a while in disorganized ways, but is now becoming more prevalent, is a fairly profitable business. Taking deposits, making loans is a way to make money. And he convinced the king of France to say, why don't we get into this business with a state monopoly and make some money out of it? Now, very soon he became famous because having realized that that was a, a good way to, a, a way to start, he realized, but hold on, if I issue the deposits, the liabilities of this, because people are going to be using it to make payments, I will be able to collect seniorage. And he discovered the first great money pump of creating seniorage, and within a few years, that created our first big hyperinflation on account of printing lots of money or liabilities. But if you take that view of what is a normal central bank, a normal central bank would be a way to tax the citizens via seniorage, that is, generate income for the government. A few years later came the Bank of Brazil, or almost 100 years later, the Banco do Brasil, which is a very different central bank. The Bank of Brazil, created by the King Regent, the Prince Regent Don Juan de Braganza, was created to be the government's bank, to take deposits from the government, to manage the, tre the, to manage the money in and out, to make loans when the king needed to build a new castle. Even more importantly, to, it had the monopoly sales of ivory, it had the monopoly of diamonds in Brazil, it was basically an agent of the government that ran some of the so-called financial affairs that the king thought it had. So much so that this bank is actually a private bank today. The Bank of Brazil still exists. It's a fully private bank. In 1967, Brazil had to create 
a new bank, the Banco Central do Brasil, which is now the actual central bank, given that this bank continued to be a completely private bank. Move forward a few more years, and then we have the Bank of Japan, created for a completely different reason than the ones before. Following the major restoration, it was very important to unite Japan as many local uh, feudal lords had control of different regions, each one of them issuing their money and having their different sets of measurement and others. As part of the major restoration of the creation of the Japanese nation, it was important that there was a national money. The Bank of Japan was created to eliminate all the regional monies and to create, to print, what would be a national money, the currency as part of creating an identity of what the Japanese state and new nation would be. Fin well, not final because I have two more, but the Federal Reserve in 1913 created for a completely different reason. It was created following 30 years of banking crisis and panics in the United States in order to be the clearinghouse for banks. That is, the bank of the bankers where different banks, as part of their normal operations, would issue liabilities, would have their customers. Customers would, it, would use the bank note, there is their deposit in a bank to make payments on a certain merchant who happened to have a relationship with a different bank. That bank would accept this as a form of payment so that only in the condition that at the end of the day, he would then meet them at the Federal Reserve and thus exchange liabilities and net out the cross liabilities that would have emerged. Having done that, the central bank would essentially make sure they wouldn't have banking crisis as in receiving payments from Mr. Lloyd's, I would be worried that since I don't know Mr. Lloyd's but I have an account with Mr. Barclays, I'd be worried that Mr. Barclays would not honor the, what today would be the debit card, back then the banknote of Mr. Lloyd's, and the, the role of the, bank, of the Federal Reserve was to make sure that these different pieces of paper would be honored and cleared. Finally, going all the way to the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, that was created with a completely different reason from the ones that I've mentioned before. The Hong Kong Monetary Authority was created entirely to hold a lot of foreign currency, issue a domestic currency that was entirely backed by that foreign currency, and manage the foreign currency holdings of the, um, of the government of Hong Kong. So, if we say, oops, what is a central bank? What is a normal central bank? And if we say, well, the answer is, let's look at the origins of what a central bank is, then we would say that the new normal conventional central bank i.e. the new conventional Bank of England, should be the manager of the national debt. So let's get rid of the debt management office. That should be the job of the Bank of England. It should generate seniors for public spending, essentially the mall of the national lottery. That's what the national lottery does in the UK. It generates some payments. It funds fun stuff. It should handle public deposit and payments, very much like the agent of an aristocratic estate, as it did in the UK for many years, or in England for many years. It should enforce national money, and so it should be dead, it should be entirely devoted to drive out Bitcoin or any other attempt at, at any other currency that can compete with the national money of the UK. It should be perhaps, it should also be a clearing house that works just like the London Stock Exchange where people meet and trade and settle transactions and should manage all the holdings of foreign currency such that most of us should have be forced to deposit our euros and dollars such that they're managed by the Bank of England. Surely this is not what the normal central bank should be what the Bank of England should aim to be over the next few years, or the Federal Reserve or others. So going to history to find what is the natural central bank, what is the normal central bank, is, in my view, a dead end. Sorry to have wasted your last seven minutes. I hope you had fun hearing fun stories, though, of history. Rather, what people mean when they say normal, what they mean, and this is normal as interpreted as, if you want, conservative, is just the way things were before the world got messy. That is, normal meaning how the central bank was not back in the 19th century, but as it was circa around 2000 and 2007, maybe a little before. And what was that central bank? Using here as an example the Bank of England. Its balance sheet consisted of in the liabilities currency, a very stable thing, the amount of banknotes people want to hold, and then deposits by banks, what are known as bank reserves, which tended to be very small mostly just equal to the required reserves by regulation, since they did, did not pay, banks would prefer to hold higher yielding assets. On the assets, treasuries, mostly of short maturity, that is government debt, as well as other assets that were managed in a very passive way, such as gold or a little foreign currency, in the case of advanced central banks. Finally, standing facilities, that is 
the, the ability to provide lender of last resort through what's known usually as the discount window. That is, that in a case of a crisis, these assets, even though Sam Steele's would tend to be zero, could grow very quickly in order to provide credit to banks and prevent financial crisis. So the Bank of England's balance sheet, all the way to 2007, was a very stable affair with, again, some government bonds, a few other stuff, not much in terms of discount window loans outside of financial crisis, and with a very stable currency and a very small amount of reserves. In terms of interest rate policy, the normal was to say that the Monetary Policy Committee targets some interbank short-term rate. This was, a, an, as the name indicates, an interbank rate, that is a, a rate that comes from equilibrium in a market in which banks want to borrow and lend from each other. And the way to achieve that was by essentially varying the amount of reserves in the economy, and thus the supply of liquidity in the economy, by relatively small amounts, in order to make sure that the market would clear near its target. So you would announce a target, this black line here in the middle, and then the market would clear, and there would be someone at the Bank of England busy issuing a few more reserves, issuing a few less reserves, buying with them government bonds in order to try and see if we'd be hit close to that target. The Bank of England would have a deposit facility rate, well below, the, well below this interbank rate, and it would also have a lending facility rate, which is nothing but this discount window I referred to. Very few banks would ever show up at the discount window. Why? Because the the way in which discount windows were run and have been run in the old, good old conservative days was such that it was public whenever a bank showed up and had to borrow at this very high rate. It was therefore clear that this bank could not convince any of these banks here in the middle to lend it a penny. As a result, it was revealed that you were, in econ lingo, theta lower bar, the lemon, and as such, uh, you were immediately attacked by all of your other creditors who want to withdraw from you and as a result, you became a cadaver within days of using the discount window. This is especially true in the US, much less so in the UK, but still a, a result of having lending facilities that are very rarely used, but which were made public very quickly. Third, the normal in terms of targets independence was to have a very clear target, a remit that would be restated every year. I have here the last one during normal times, signed by then Chancellor Gordon Brown and sent to then Governor Mervyn King, saying that you should hit your inflation target and try to not make sure that employment and the growth is somewhat stable. This is a fairly clear one. And the bank would therefore communicate and its independence by saying, we're going to set the interest rate at so-and-so because we think that if doing so, we'll keep inflation on target. And that's what central banking was. You would grumble from time to time about fiscal policy, and that happened especially afterwards, and that you would say, well, but the fiscal authorities are engaging in too much expansion or contraction of fiscal policy, and that's making my job hard. And the lingo for that was to say headwinds and tailwinds, as if you were trying to steer a boat and fiscal policy would make your job harder or easier. So that, that's what the normal was. Not the historical normal, but the normal of someone who lived 2000, 2007 is when this stabilized. If you want to be generous, from 1987 to 2007, this was the normal. But not much before that. Before that, it was quite different. This in contrast to the extraordinary. And the extraordinary was that during the crisis, we had that, that very simple balance sheet blew up. Here you have the case for the Federal Reserve, where the Federal Reserve started a bunch of new different funding programs, started buying agency debt, mortgage-backed securities, started laying directly to a series of other people, and printed an enormous amount of new amounts of reserves, which grew from zero to 860 billion. And at the same time, it installed a series of new liquidity facilities, on top of the discount window, which, as usual, was barely used, it started term auction credit in which you would auction up and give some anonymity for a few days, a commercial paper funding facility in which you could go and borrow from the Fed by giving us collateral, not the usual government bonds, but rather commercial paper, central bank liquidity stops, some longer duration, the so-called TSLF, which was some longer duration loans to banks than the usual just one week or 28 days, 28 days discount window loans. Extraordinary monetary policy rates was that the Federal Reserve started paying interest on reserves, and as, re as interest rates became very low, close to zero, it started conducting policy by telling people what it would do about future interest rates. So we started judging policy not in terms of what would change in monetary policy, the left side diagram, but in terms of giving a speech, what did the market anticipate that the federal funds rate would be in 24 months' time? So the tool to evaluate policy stopped being what happened to interest rates, but what people expect the Federal Reserve will do to interest rates, or the Bank of England or the ECB. In terms of communication, 
Speeches got very long. Policy communications went from two paragraphs saying this is the interest rate, this is the inflation target, to paragraphs and paragraphs about financial stability, not just communicating future policy and interest rates, but especially the macro prudential goals. How are we going to do it? This is what we anticipate for the future. We're going to maintain. This is how we're going to manage our balance sheet. This is what we hope will be a good idea for financial stability. So, is this a good idea, though? The goal of this lecture, or my goal for this lecture, is to tell you that, is to convince you that we should stop looking at history or the past to figure out what should be the new normal, but instead start thinking about what should be the ideal. And why so? Because over the last 10 years, it's not just that we deviated from the normal to the extraordinary, and it is not that all changes are for the best, but rather that by changing, we did an economist, or better even, an academic's dream, or a scientist's dream, which is we did variation. We experimented. We did lots of different strange, extraordinary things. And there's nothing better for a scientist than experimenting, because that means that we learned in theory and in data how is it that different things, different abnormal, extraordinary things, may actually work or not work in different ways. As a result, today, as a result of experiments and shocks, we can discuss ideals that come not just from theory or from data, in terms of what should be the new conventional central bank, certainly guided by history, but as much as informed by history and by what worked in the, in, in the year 2000, also by what we've learned about uh, through the experimentation of the last 10 years. So what I will do for my remainder, according to this 43 minutes, is to tell you about some of that that we've learned and conclude somewhat boldly, because this is a lecture as opposed to a research paper, what I have learned in terms of what the new conventional central bank should be. I will unapologetically, most of what follows is going to be a summary of my research, meaning in the last five years, this has been the question that has been driving almost all of my research, which is trying to understand what can I learn from these experiments, what should the new central bank be, as opposed to what it used to be, and I'll be summarizing work that I've done with many co-authors, some of whom are, are in the audience here today. I'm going to organize this in four facets. I'm going to tell you what should be the new conventional balance sheet, what should be the new conventional liquidity programs, the new monetary policy rates, and the new targets and communication. This is the structure that I used when I was telling you what the normal was just five minutes ago. So let's start with the balance sheet. What should be the new conventional balance sheet? I'm going to start with what I think I learned and what I think is ideal given what I've learned. On this, let's start with liabilities. And the liabilities, what happened and I learned was that the Fed went from having, as I told you, a certain amount of currency, which was quite small and kept steady throughout. This is the red line. There was a slight increase. People desired a little bit more dollars post-2009. Many of you may have heard about the death of currency, that nobody uses currency, everyone uses debit cards. Not true, actually. There's more dollars now than before, and they've increased. Reason, during financial stability, a lot of people outside the US decide to stash dollars in their mattress much more than before. But beyond that, it's very constant and not very stable. What changed dramatically was that reserves, deposits of banks at the central bank, went from essentially zero, close to zero, to very large numbers. They peaked at something like three trillion. Okay. What we learned from that is that one, we can do it. How do we do it? We start paying interest on those reserves. Whereas banks used to say, I can earn 3% by buying a bond and I get, receive zero when I deposit at the Fed or at the Bank of England. Now they were told the Bank of England will pay you 3%. So when the Bank of England came and said, by the way, can I buy your bonds and give you instead deposits with me? They pay exactly the same interest as the bonds that you have. Banks were very happy to do it, and this was a very easy way to do this. What happened as a result was that the interest rate, the interbank rate, the interest rate on the private bonds, the red line if you want, as this amount increased, became equal to the blue line here, which you can barely see because it's essentially on top of the red line. That is that the other side of the coin of issuing a lot of reserves is that the interest rate that you started paying on the deposit central bank became equal to the interest rate that was paid in the private market, the interbank rate. 
Economists call this that the market for reserves was satiated. What do we mean by that? In simple terms, when the quantity goes up, nothing happens to the price, the relative price, it must be that the demand curve is horizontal. If you shift supply to the right and nothing happens to the price, the demand must be horizontal. If the demand for something is horizontal, it means that consumers are, sa or not, in this case not consumers, banks, are satiated with it. You can give them more, they're happy, they're indifferent to have more. You give them less, they're happy to have less as well. When did satiation happen? It happened exactly when these interest rates became the same, when the cost of holding this became zero. And you, we can just map these two pictures and say it happened somewhere between 500 billion and 1 trillion, around there. It did not happen when interest rates are zero. It happened when interest rates were positive, and it's continued to be the case even as interest rates have been raised above 1% in the United States over the last 24 months. As long as interest rate reserves was the same as the interbank rate, the private rate, then the market has continued to be satiated and many trillions of reserves have continued to be outstanding. We learned that we can satiate this market. We learned that it only takes half a trillion to do so. We learned, moreover, that this is fine because as opposed to targeting an interbank rate and trying to buy and sell things in the private market to target it, we can simply choose the interest we pay on reserves. Having three trillion of them outstanding, we now say, well, let's just raise the amount we pay on that rate from 1% to 5%, and lo and behold, the interbank rate in the private market jumps from 1% to 5% that same instant. Why? Because everyone has abundant reserves, abundant deposits, all banks have abundant deposits, the central bank, and will therefore not be willing to invest in anything unless it pays precisely the new 5% that the central bank has set. A third thing we learn is that after satiation, that is after 2009, issuing more reserves, increasing the liability of the central bank, does nothing to inflation. Again, we can say this with great confidence. We can say this by using just basic, if you want, baby econometrics, i.e. plot things and see that the blue line increased like crazy and nothing happened to inflation. You can't triple a series, the blue series, and yet have inflation be exactly 1% rather than double or triple. Okay? This is the best kind of econometrics. You don't need the standard errors. Something increases by three and something else doesn't change at all. Coefficient has to be zero or very close to zero. Or you can be a little fancier and say, well, let's go, let's go and examine what are the expected inflation in financial markets. Let's do what in finance is known as an event study. Let's, let's compare where we're expected inflation expectations of inflation before and after speeches and changes in policy that led to these big jumps up, and do a comparison of before and after to see whether these made any difference, not even to actual inflation, but just to expected inflation in the markets. And when we were back here before the one trillion, they made a big difference. You issued reserves, people started expecting a lot more inflation. The red and blue were different from each other. And yet for each one of these jumps up, I picked here one, the one right after here, Nothing happened to expected inflation, even as you issued a lot more reserves. Is this, we learned this, but we learned more now from the side of theory, if you want. We learned, I think, but not so much, we, well, we learned some of it, some of it we knew from before, is that this is not just possible, doable, consistent with central banking, consistent with the inflation under control, but also that it's actually desirable. The plot here, by the way, on the right, just shows you that the satiation did not happen because there was one bank at the margin that held a lot of reserves. If you look at the distribution function of reserves across all 1,000 banks in the United States, all of them hold a lot of reserves. All of them are satiated. This distribution function, the CDF, all shifted to the right across this time. Why was this good? First, as opposed to targeting an interest rate, spending a lot of time trying to hit it, and missing very often, you now just set exactly what you want the lower bound to be, and there's no variability around it. Insofar as interest rates are the way in which we control inflation today, you now set the policy rate as opposed to targeting a policy rate. It's easier to control inflation when you actually set the lever as opposed to trying to target what that lever would be. Second, it meant that in the control of inflation and in the conduct of monetary policy, what can focus on what study after study has shown to be more important transmission of policy, which is how does change in interest rates affect the risk premium 
that banks then apply in order to set their, inter their lending rates as compared to their deposit rates that are set by the central bank. Risk premium stopped being polluted by liquidity premium. That is, to what extent banks just needed a lot of liquidity, needed a lot of reserves at some point to deal with some withdrawal, and therefore held back at some point or, or went too long in terms of providing credit because they happened to be sitting on a lot of reserves or too few reserves at any point in time. Credit and lending rates in the transition monetary policy stop depending on how many reserves you happen to have because you have so many that who cares? You're indifferent. You're satiated. Third, it meant that frequent demand shocks and hoarding crises, which are the day-to-day -day life of what a liquidity market is, most of the time you don't need it, sometimes you need a lot of it, used to be a big challenge and a big thing for monetary policy to set and to target and to keep an eye on. And now that the demand is satiated, is essentially irrelevant. A horizontal line when it shifts to the right doesn't change, shift over itself. Demand for liquidity may go up or down, as long as you're far into, the, into where it is horizontal, it stops affecting monetary policy or the control of inflation. Fourth, there is a scarcity of safe assets in the world, and government bonds have been we have multiple evidence from different parts that are in the last 10 years from multiple studies that there's an absence of government bonds that are therefore become very valuable as a form of collateral and therefore push for very low interest rates in government bonds at all maturities and to a series of distortion across financial markets as a result of the absence of collateral. Well, reserves are as safe as an asset as it gets, better than government bonds. If firms are using reserves as opposed to government bonds, to engage in payments and to manage their liquidity, that releases government bonds, more government bonds to serve their role as collateral. Fifth, and perhaps though what should have been first, is that paying an interest on reserves that's equal to the interbank rate, satiate the market for liquidity, is what economists, or at least macroeconomists, had for a long time <coughs> called one of the best free lunches there is in economics. This is so known as the Friedman Rule. If you can issue reserves at zero marginal cost, which you can, and we proved that you could, why would there ever be a why would you ever not satiate the market for reserves? Why would you not ever drive the cost of liquidity to zero by driving interbank interest rates to the rate on deposits? Finally, and more looking forward, reserves are, of course, the original digital money. There's a lot of excitement with digital money today. Digital money has been with us for 100 years, more, deposit the central bank or digital money. They're an entry in an Excel sheet that the Bank of England has. Barclays has 100 million. I go there, I put a two, and now it has 200 million. That's digital money. That's what reserves are. Barclays pays Lloyd's 10 million. I subtract 10 from that Excel sheet cell. I add 10 to another Excel cell. Excel cell, sorry. Um, okay. The question for the future is if we think that digital money is such a lovely idea, instead of having to reinvent the wheel, why don't, why don't we just let people have accounts, deposit accounts at the central bank? Nothing stops us from doing that. The infrastructure exists. Nowadays, digital money exists only for banks who can deposit at the Bank of England, not for citizens or other people who may wish to do so. So digital money could be created instantly as long as we had a satiated market for reserves, not if everyone's trying to compete to get the scarce reserves with the banks. So this is a good idea. How do you do it then? How do you keep the market for reserves satiated? The central bank, the Bank of England, Silvana sitting there, since I think she's the only person actually serving in the MPC right now in the room, can announce monetary policy by the Bank of England, can consist of announcing an interest on reserves or deposits. It is X percent. And then at the same time, announce that the target for the interbank rate, so this is what we've been doing for the last 10 years. This is what we were doing before 2007, let's now do both. Let's announce a target for the rate at which you would get remunerated for deposit in the Bank of England, and let's announce a target for what we would like the interbank rate to be. And let's announce those to be the same number. For if they are the same number, we will say, this is how much we're remunerating reserves, and this is our tool for controlling inflation. And we now, sitting at the Monetary Policy Committee, have instructed the markets division of the bank to achieve, as they used to before 2007, so they'll be happy, they'll be back to normal, achieve a rate for the interbank rate, but we'll tell them, you have to make sure that's the same as the one that we're paying on deposits. How will they do that? 
Well, they'll have to issue reserves, buy bonds as needed, in order to get to the point where they are at the satiation point. So instead of telling them do half a trillion, one trillion, or whatever number it is, just instruct the market's team to keep whatever is the minimum amount of reserves needed to make sure that we are the target for the interbank rate equal to the deposit rate. Choosing the size of the balance sheet will no longer be something that the MPC has to debate, discuss, and decide in every meeting, but rather will be a pure operational procedure that the markets will have to implement in terms of keeping the balance sheet as, as high as it takes, but no more, in order to make sure that X percent is that. Communication by the central bank will go back to the good old days, interest rates. No longer we're buying 500 billion or selling 10 billion, or we'd like the balance sheet to decline at a rate of 2.3% over the next 25 years, as Jerome Powell communicates, and many central banks nowadays do, but communicate just in terms of interest rates but communicate in terms of two interest rates and realize that it's a pure operational procedure to make sure that given a demand for reserves, your supply should be at the point where the demand is horizontal and no further than that. Liabilities. Let's turn to assets. The good old days were and when the assets were short-term treasuries. And that is a good idea from several perspectives and one that has been confirmed or that we've learned with the experience of the last two years, 10 years, which is that because short-term treasuries are closely matched in properties to reserves or deposits of the central bank, there, there is a close match between those assets and the liabilities of the central bank. They're similar in maturity, they're similar in the interest rate they pay, they're similar in that they're both government liabilities. As a result, again, the size, the operational choice, is one that in principle does not lead to a big change in the stance of policy or in the interference with other market outcomes because it's the central bank issuing reserves, debts of the central bank, to buy debts of the treasury. They're both debts of the government. Insofar as they're close to maturity and matched, it implies that whatever profit the central bank makes out of this is given by this blue line here, which is the gap between the one-year rate and the overnight rate, which tends to be pretty close to zero, almost always positive, and very easy to manage. Importantly, whether the balance sheet happens to have to grow or fall because the demand for reserves shifted to the right or not, the profits are always going to be steady, small, manageable, and not attract the greed of policymakers with great policy plans. Okay. What have we learned, though, in terms of differences between these two? We've learned, though, that even though this is an ideal case, there is an exception in which these two become quite different. What is different between the Treasury issuing a liability saying, here's a piece of paper saying, I owe you 10 pounds next month, and the central bank issuing a piece of paper saying, I owe you 10 pounds next month. For the most part, they're exactly identical. They're just two liabilities from the government. They have a difference, though, is that one, the central bank debt, reserves, the post central bank, are held exclusively by banks. I can buy the one issued by the treasury. I cannot buy the one issued by the central bank. And secondly, that reserves are, by definition, the unit of account in our economy. A pound means one deposit at the, central at, at the central bank, at the Bank of England. Okay? By definition, in nominal terms, they're default-free. A pound is a pound. You never default on what a pound is because a pound is a pound. Okay? Not the case with government bonds, where I promise to pay you a pound, and then I give you 10p by defaulting on the government bond. When do these become relevant? Precisely in a fiscal crisis. In a fiscal crisis where we expect the government or the treasury to default, QE, quantitative easing, that is, issuing reserves to buy the, short, the government bonds, what it does is, on the one hand, transfer risk away from the banks. Why? Because banks, I go to banks and I tell them, you're holding this government bond that may default. Here's a government bond that doesn't default. Reserves. That just means that the holders of the other government bonds, the non-banks, now hold more risk, of course, because there will be higher risk on those. But in a fiscal crisis, Quantitative easing is indeed providing, if you want a dirty word, a bailout of the banks, so far as it's giving them a riskless asset as opposed to a risky asset that they had. But secondly, it's also an increase in the supply of the safe assets in the economy at that point, because again, the reserves in nominal terms will be default free. And is it often 
a change in the maturity of the debt because when you go and do it, even a difference between a one-year bond and, a one, and an overnight reserve becomes very relevant during a fiscal crisis in a way that it is in normal times. So in a fiscal crisis, this can matter buying the short-term treasuries, even if most of the time it does not. It's important to note that, that a central bank that does this in a fiscal crisis is, of course, a central bank that is issuing bonds, liabilities, that are safe, by definition, reserves, to buy risky, possibly defaulting government bonds. What happens if they default? The central bank has lost money. What does, what does it mean for a central bank to lose money? It means that it has to pay a lower dividend to its owner, the treasury, the fiscal authority. Defaulting on bonds when the bonds are held by the central bank is not defaulting at all, in a certain sense. Insofar as the central bank passes its losses to the treasury, the treasury defaulting on its central bank ends up being neutral fiscally, we have learned. What about other assets? If you have unmatched liabilities and assets, then you can make losses. If a central bank holds long-term bonds funded by short-term reserves, it is subject to duration risk, or if you want, the yield curve changing. To be more provocative, a central bank that buys long-term government bonds is a long-short hedge fund. You finance yourself overnight with reserves, and you buy a long-term asset. If the yield curve flattens, you've made money. If the yield curve steepens, you've lost money. Likewise, a central bank that issues pound reserves and chooses to buy lots of euros is subject to the risk that the euro-pound exchange rate will change. Central banks all over the world have lost a lot of money by buying foreign assets and seeing then their currency unexpectedly appreciate and therefore finding that their foreign reserves are now worth a lot less. If, you, if your liabilities and assets are unmatched in duration, currency, or something else, then you can make large losses. Now, central banks are experts at devising accounting schemes to hide these losses. They don't mark to market their assets, but mark them to book. They claim that, well, if I hold the bond to maturity, then you won't have any losses, even if the yield curve changes. They use deferred accounts, that is, different ways in order to provision and others. But all of these are nothing but, as usual with accounting, ways to hide or switch or shift the flows of resources over time. Because ultimately, if you've lost money, what that implies is that you now need to pay less dividends to the treasury and potentially negative dividends. In that situation, there are two theorems that I developed with co-author Robert Hall, which I think are important to understand how this unmatching matters or doesn't matter. The first theorem is that if a central bank always pays as dividends its net income, then it is always solvent. If the central bank loses money for whatever reason, or sorry, if the central bank makes money for whatever reason, it pays it to the treasury. If it loses money, and yet the treasury just transfers to it, i.e. a negative dividend, whatever it's lost, then the central bank is always solvent. The central bank is not any different from the Department of Transportation or the Department of Pensions, which sometimes make money, sometimes lose money, but the Chancellor of the Exchequer always backs them, and therefore they're never independently insolvent in any sense. This, of course, requires this so-called fiscal support. Sometimes if the central bank loses money, it needs a transfer from the Treasury. Theorem number two. If the central bank has negative net income and does not receive a transfer from the Treasury, this is a very realistic case, the European Central Bank, there is no provision on how the Spanish government can send money to the European Central Bank to recapitalize it after a loss. There'll have to be an unanimous agreement of the entire euro system to recapitalize it if it has negative net income. If the central bank cannot therefore receive a recapitalization, if you want, receive negative pay negative dividends, receive negative net income, then it will, and this is a mathematical theorem, with probability one, eventually become insolvent. Why is that? And to, to explain that, let me, ex let, me take a, let me explain to you what do I mean by an insolvent central bank. How can a central bank go insolvent? Certainly there's no such thing as a bankruptcy code for central banks. So again, looking at the law or even at accounting is not going to be very helpful. Yet, like any economic agent, the central bank faces a resource constraint. And what is a resource constraint? It's nothing but a statement that your liabilities cannot be a Ponzi scheme. I cannot borrow from you and never pay you back. If I try to do that, you don't hold my liabilities. They are now worthless. I am so-called insolvent. 
That's what insolvency means in economic theory. It has nothing to do with bankruptcy courts. Okay? It doesn't matter whether, by the way, I can issue pieces of paper or IOU saying I owe you a million or a billion or a trillion. As long as you're willing to pay me zero for those pieces of paper, I'm insolvent. A central bank issues liabilities. They're called reserves, deposits. We've talked about them already. They're nominal liabilities. They're IOUs in the currency in the unit of account of the, of the central bank. However, when I issue a reserve, I buy something with it that has some real value. The real value of reserves is one over the price level, by definition of them being the unit of account. What does it mean then for a central bank to be insolvent? It means that you, the banks, don't want to hold my liabilities anymore. You don't want to hold my reserves. What does it mean for you not to hold them if the market has to clear, if reserves issue, someone has to hold them? It means simply that your value of my piece of paper, I'm now the central bank, no longer Ricardo, is now zero. But what does it mean for the value of reserves to be zero? Well, if their value is 1 over P, P is infinity. Central bank insolvency happens all the time. We just give it a different name. We call it hyperinflation. It's when the reserves of the central bank are worthless. They don't default in a bankruptcy court sense. They default by, in the sense of nobody wants to hold them, nobody values them as being anything but garbage or being worthless. That's what insolvent central bank is. A central bank that accumulates that income and is never recapitalized is one that issues reserves to deal with its capital losses and will never be able to retire its reserves, it will by definition be running a Ponzi scheme on its reserves. So, given what we've learned, short-term treasuries, how, what can policy do? Let me start by, by going back to something that I had said already in the previous conclusion, which is the, the Monetary Policy Committee can instruct the um, markets team to set the, balance, the size of the balance sheet in order to keep its target for the interest rate. And yet sometimes, in exceptional times, it may choose to engage in an unconventional policy called quantitative easing. And what does that consist of? Telling the markets team, you're no longer in charge, I now tell you what the size of the balance sheet is. Understand that in that choice of size, what matters is not the size per se, we're indifferent on the size of the reserves, what matters is the composition. When the MPC takes that, it doesn't matter saying, this is how much, how many reserves we're gonna issue, what's important is what are we gonna buy with them. Therefore, QE should always be about how we're deviating from only buying short-term treasuries and not about the amount that one does so. This may want to be done for whatever financial stability or whatever reasons, even if not inflation control, but in doing so, it's important to focus on the composition of what's bought and to understand the income risks that are associated with them. Whatever are the proposed benefits, the importance to realize what is the chances that the bank even will lose money in these given the now mismatch between its liabilities and assets? Are we happy with our risk? What kind of fiscal support do we have for it? Likewise, moving forward, to secure a more permanent or stable, if you want, fiscal support. In the case of the Bank of England, it famously got Mervyn King, Governor Mervyn King famously got a letter of indemnity from the Treasury before he engaged in QE, saying that the Treasury would fiscally support any losses it made. In the case of the ECB, it still doesn't have that, and instead negotiates every time, every time that we think QE is a good idea, there has to be a, um, um, a Eurogroup summit where we choose to recapitalize the ECB, almost pay them off so that they actually do what's right in terms of QE. Importantly, it's to secure in the treaties of the central bank a secure form of fiscal support that makes sure that you're never engaging in overt fiscal policy, by which I mean generating dividends as a steady flow for the, for the government in order to monitor finance its deficits, but simply to cover the operations of the central bank. As importantly, do not fall for traps. Do not fall for people that tell you the central bank can never go bankrupt. You can always print money and do whatever you want. Everything will be fine. A country that has its independent central bank can never go bankrupt, can never go insolvent, can achieve what can achieve, can release itself of any budget constraint, for these are, of course, fallacies and traps. Insolvency happens. It happens through hyperinflation. Turning next to facilities, the other part of the balance sheet. What's new is, what did I learn and what was new in the last few years? In the last few years, there have been the establishment of a series of swap lines within central banks. In particular, dollar swap lines. What is a dollar swap line? 
The Federal Reserve lends dollars to the Bank of England, which lends them in turn to UK banks. Why is this a swap line? Because the Bank of England gives pounds as collateral to the Fed, which then reverses a week later when it pays it back its dollars. The Fed sets the interest rate on these, and they're the ones printing the dollars. They increase the monetary base. The Bank of England, they pick the collateral, they pick who to lend to, what collateral to accept, and therefore bear the credit risk if the UK bank does not pay it back. The swap lines are basically the twin sister of the discount window for foreign banks. If a US bank wants to borrow from the US Fed, it shows up at the discount window at the lending facilities. If Barclays wants to borrow from the Fed, it instead shows up at the Bank of England and says, please give me dollars through the swap line. And these have become very large. This is the total dollar swap lines broken down here by the ECB, the Bank of England, and the Bank of Japan. What have we learned? We've learned that these swap lines have a big effect on deviations from covered interest parity. What do I mean by that? An alternative for Barclays to buy dollars, sorry, to get dollars from the Bank of England would be simply for Barclay to get pounds to the standard liquidity facilities and to then go and buy its dollars. Now, because it has to pay back pounds to the Bank of England, Barclays would be carrying some exchange rate risk. But what can Barclays do? It can today buy a forward contract that fixes the terms at which it can get pounds back for the dollars that it got in order to pay back the Bank of England. This is a so-called the, the way to do a covered trade. You get pounds, you like dollars, no problem. Buy the dollars, insure yourself to a forward contract. This is the, prin the principle of covered interest parity says that the gap in interest rates across countries should be such that engage borrowing in dollars or borrowing in pounds is exactly equivalent. Over the last 10 years, this principle has not held very well. It has become, if you want, the rate at which you can insure yourself against fluctuations in the pound in the sterling dollar exchange rate has fluctuated wildly and has made covering your positions be very expensive. The CIPD rate should be zero, and yet look at their histograms over the last uh, 10 years on the pound dollar. Okay? It's actually not over the last 10 years. This is the, in the, a month in 2011. Well, what does the swap line do? By changing the terms at which you can borrow from the Bank of England, dollars from the Bank of England, it means that you can now put a ceiling, that is, have a maximum cost in how much you can pay the Bank of England. You can, or that you can pay, for, sorry, for the forward rates by using the market as an alternative. What I've shown you here is there was a change in how much the Fed charged in its swap line in November 2011. What I've plotted for you here in the green line, in the green histogram, was what the distribution of, of CI forward contract prices was and the CIP deviations across a series of currencies that had swap plan agreements with the Fed. And in white, I show you when the Fed made the swap line cheaper by 50 basis points, what happened to the CIP deviations in white? And what you see is that lowering the cost immediately as a ceiling would kill the right tail that it shrank how expensive it was in private markets to do this. If this is the before and after, if you want, those of you who have learned your econometrics, you can do then a difference in difference in the before and after between the swap line currencies and the non-swap line currencies around this announcement, and you see that this only happened for the swap line currencies as a result indicating that indeed uh, this swap line bounded the CIP deviations. There's something more that, what does it do by bounding the CIP deviation, by making it cheaper for banks to cover themselves when they invest abroad, for Barclays when it makes a dollar investment? It also implies that when Barclays invests in the U.S. assets, relying on U.S. funding, and that U.S. funding all of a sudden disappears such that it wants, needs to replace it with liquidity, then by lowering the price of the swap line, you're lowering how expensive it is to indeed use this facility in order to overcome your funding difficulties and shortages. What do you, would we expect if I tell you that in an investment, to cover that investment, it is now cheaper in case of a crisis to replace those funds? Well, you would expect that banks would be happier to invest in dollars because now I've given you a cheaper insurance in case your funding for dollars appears. What I have here in this plot is, before I showed you a diff and diff, now this is a diff and diff and diff and diff, a triple diff and diff. 
which is along the days after which the Fed made the swap line cheaper, comparing as before swap and non-swap line banks, Barclays versus the New Zealand bank whose swap, who swap line terms didn't change, and I'll compare Barclays' choices of whether to buy dollar corporate bonds versus pound corporate bonds. And what you see in the blue line is that in response to having a cheaper insurance against dollar funding withdrawal, Barclays, within a few days, shifted a very large part of its portfolio away from pound bonds and towards dollar bonds. The difference between the blue and the red line. So that's what I've learned. So what do I have learned about this? I've learned that, one, that these central bank swap lines are important. If we're going to have global banks, by which I mean Barclays investing in dollar assets, we have to have dollar discount windows. Since the Bank of England can print dollars, the next best thing is have a swap line with the Fed to get the dollars when needed. They safeguard the markets in the United States in the case of the dollar because they prevent a fire sale of US assets. They safeguard the banks in the UK. In doing so, these swap lines have been particularly effective because unlike the discount window, and as I told you, the discount window generates cadavers, the swap line does not. Even today in 2018, I showed you that there was these big swap lines that the Lots of European banks got lots of dollars. Ten years later, the ECB still hasn't told me which European banks got them. It's still a secret. As a result, there was no stigma. I don't know who the cadavers were, and hopefully by now, they've moved from cadavers to zombies to healthy people, or to healthy banks. Okay? Importantly, though, this... Well, no, let me fix that. Um, moving forward, what's happening in the next few months and what cannot stay... of any presentation on economic policy in this country for the past 12 months and the next 12 months, Brexit, we have UK banks that have enormous Euro business. They're going to need Euro funding sometimes. Stuff is going to happen. Crises are going to happen. They're going to have to have access to Euros. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a swap line with the bank, between the Bank of England and the ECB that assures it. Maybe it's something else, but this is surely an important part of what the new normal Bank of England should be. So to conclude on the balance sheet, Here's my new conventional balance sheet. I didn't even bother to talk about currency. I can in the Q&A. It's not that important. It's steady. People like it. People like pieces of paper with a queen on them. Give it to them. But it's very st their love for a piece of paper with a queen on them is a very steady thing. It's not very interesting. Deposits, though, are very interesting. Let their size be endogenous. Use the interest rate you pay on them as the main tool of monetary policy. And they're endogenous by targeting another interest rate to be equal to them. And think, maybe, should you let Ricardo open an account at the Bank of England and he, not just Barclays, have a deposit there if you really care about digital currency. Hold short treasuries so that you have, outside of fiscal crisis, no income risk in the balance sheet of the central bank, but get ready to do QE for emergency, but focusing not on the size, but on the composition. As standing facilities complement the traditional domestic with swap lines for the foreigners balance sheet covered, let's move to interest rates and how interest rates are adjusted and set by the central bank. What have we learned? First, we've learned that, and as a follow-up, as a segue from what we've talked about in the last 35 minutes, price control is not about dollars chasing goods. It's not about money. It's not about currency. It's not about reserves. Why do I know this? Because inflation goes up and down and currency is very stable. Because we, issue, we went from zero reserves to three trillion of them, and nothing happened to inflation. MV equals PY is not a very useful theory. Sorry to the students who suffered through it and are <laughs> revising it for the exam. It's a great theory of hyperinflation. That's why I force you to learn it for a couple of classes. If you understand hyperinflation, MV equals PY is great. If you understand why inflation was high in the UK this year relative to 20 years ago, it's a dreadful theory. It doesn't help at all. M currency doesn't change at all. M reserves increase by factors of infinity, and nothing happens to P. Okay? Instead, what we've learned is that over the last 20 years, including the crisis, independent central banks focusing not on MV equals PY, but on the Fisher equation, that is setting nominal interest rates with an eye on what expected inflation is and responding to shocks to the economy in terms of shocks to the real interest rate, following feedback rules, of which the most famous is the Taylor rule, have done amazingly well. In the 400 years of history of the Bank of England, I plot here for you what average inflation and the volatility of the living inflation was in every 20-year period. 
Here is the last 20 years. Here's ideal, 2% inflation, zero volatility. Look how amazing the independent central bank, Bank of England, has done. As people sometimes discuss of maybe we shouldn't have an independent Bank of England, remember this picture. We've tried lots of other regimes. Look how well looking at it. As people tell you, oh, the tail rule doesn't work very well. What about an independent central bank? Look at where we are. Look at what the goal. Look at what everything else, monetarism, gold. As people tell the gold standard was wonderful, look at it. As people tell you, oh, having the treasury be the boss of the Bank of England, look at what happened. At the same time, as I gloat in the success of economic theory based on the Fisher equation, which the students here also learned, not just MV equals PY, I did learn something post-2010. I learned that nothing happened to inflation after 2010. Here's inflation average over, the, over 19 advanced economies in the 10 years before, here's in the 10 years after. Now, there's a lot of relative price changes, commodity price shocks around here. So let me get rid of them and look at trends. And let me look at the Eurozone in the US separately as opposed to averaging all. You know, yes, things change a little bit after 2010, but come on, by 50 basis points. Nothing much happened to inflation. On the one hand, you'd say that's great. That was the goal, right? Low volatility. But on the other hand, lots of things changed past 2010. Interest rates didn't follow a Taylor rule in the last seven years. They were fixed. They were pegged. And yet, unlike the theory that I taught my poor students, we didn't have an anchoring of inflation expectations. We had a huge recession. And yet, unlike that Phillips curve that I taught you, we didn't have a huge fall in inflation. We tried lots of different policies. We experimented. And yet, unlike the models of discretion and rules that I teach you and of credibility, we've had no volatility of inflation as people try to figure out what the central bank is doing. We've had an enormous increase in the public debt. And yet, unlike the theories of how hyperinflations are driven when, when we have lots of, lots of public debt, we've had no expectation of all of inflating the debt. Okay? So I, at the same time as we've had a success, we have to explain why is it that nothing happened here when everything happened for every single determinant of inflation I have in the theories that I teach you. The left hand side didn't change, but the right hand side changed a lot. It didn't change at 5,000, like the M, so forget about M, but still things changed a lot. And I spent a lot of time pinning down those coefficients on those right hand side variables, and I thought they were important and they weren't zero, and then lots of things changed on the right hand side and nothing changed on the left hand side. Now, why is this? People have argued that it was luck, good policies. It's still striking that today you'll open, in the last couple of years or three years, you'll open the Financial Times and you'll see impassioned op-eds on how the ECB is doing terribly because inflation is 0.5% below target. Let me remind you that the measurement error of the CPI is 0.7%, the standard error. So that's how well we've done. That's how stable the thing is when you complain that it's 0.4% below and we're not even sure if it's plus minus 0.6. Um, but at the same time, my confidence that I know what determines inflation has decreased a lot. So policymakers should rejoice, academics should worry, in that I don't re I'm much less confident than I was on how is it I can control inflation, what is it that controls it, what determines it. Okay? Now, at the same time, we've learned something in terms of innovations. One thing that has been that one thing that has been an innovation has been a focus on long-term rates. Central banks, much more than before, have started talking in terms of this and that policy affected the two-year rate, the five-year rate, or the 10-year rate. This is something that is not new. Central banks in the past used to focus a lot on long-term rates during some times in history. The experience from those, I have to say, was not very good. Whenever the, when the Bank of England focused on long-term rates in the 1950s, when the Fed focused on long-term rates in the late 1940s, it had a lot of trouble controlling inflation, and it couldn't even develop theories of why that is. What I have here for those brave of you is a phase diagram. And if you're targeting a long-term rate, what you, the problem you have is that on top of the nice equilibrium that you like, would like inflation to be, you have escape dynamics such that you may end up with a very high inflation rate on account of having that ceiling on inflation. The danger is that you may fall in a high inflation trap and if you look at the U.S. monetary history between 1947 and 1950, that's exactly what happened and why the long-term rate f disappeared. 
basically the central bank interest rates start rising, in the case of the US because of the expectation of the Korean War leading to large budget deficits and big increase in the real interest rate. The central bank having its target in the long-term rate does not raise nominal interest rates correspondingly. As a result, expectations of future inflation start rising. They become self-fulfilling insofar as the nominal interest rate continues to be pegged and a high inflation results. Now, today, we could, of course, implement this, and it's important to realize that while the central bank today sets the short-term rate, the central bank could equally well set the two-year rate, the five-year rate, or the 10-year rate. The reason why the central bank sets the overnight rate, it's because it has overnight deposits and choose the interest rate on them. Nothing stops the bank from saying, I'm going to have a one-year deposit. Guess what? You set the interest rate on that one instead. So you can control these. Controlling the one-year or five-year rates comes with a problem that first, any changes in term premium that is in the gap between the overnight rate and the one-year rate translate into shocks to inflation. So you now have to be monitoring what's happening to term premium. But also, likewise, that the control of inflation, whereas today we say if we lower short-term rates to push up inflation, that's actually not quite correct, and we should do this better. I think I did this a little better to my master students. I don't think I did such a good job with the undergraduates. Sorry is that lowering short-term rates is not what pushes up inflation. What pushes up inflation is lowering short-term rates relative to long-term rates. Steepening the yield curve is what leads to, in, leads to higher inflation. If you're now setting the 10-year rate or the five-year rate, then to raise inflation, you need to raise the rate, not lower the rate, because that's the way to make the yield curve steeper. That is a big difference in how monetary policy is conducted and one that central banks should start being aware before they start saying, I would like the 10-year rate to fall. If you want the 10-year rate to fall and do nothing to the short-term rate, that doesn't increase inflation. That lowers inflation. If you lower the 10-year rate by lowering the overnight rate by more in expectations of short period, that's what increases inflation. Next step, though, is the one adopted by the Bank of Japan, who starts saying, why don't I set the short-term rate as well as the long-term rate? In the case of the Bank of Japan, the 10-year rate. What that does is that you're targeting both the safe rate as well as a series of long rates, which given that the long rates are nothing but the safe rates plus risk premium, is you targeting a safe rate plus N minus one inflation risk premium. Insofar as the inflation risk premium depends on the volatility of inflation, our inflation response to shocks, what central banks that target long rates will do, what the BOJ is doing through the yield curve control, is giving very strong signals in how it will let inflation respond to shocks in the future. Let me skip this in the interest of time. So, what is a new conventional interest rate policy? The MPC will set the rate in the deposit at X percent, and as I said, the size of the deposit grows by whatever it takes to keep the short-term rates anchored. We'll have our standard liquidity facilities, and importantly, we set the interest rate on them in discussion with our partners to, to deal with the liquidity needs. Interest rates following feedback rules seem to work well, but sometimes, in particular when overnight rates are zero, we need to have unconventional interest rate policies that are consistent with our target. They will involve, I skipped the second one in, because I'm running out of time, but the first one is issuing term deposits of Z months at some rate, using that to control whatever are the inflation risk premium, but being very, very weary of the dangers that come with it that inflation goes out of control. Finally, targets in independence. What have I learned in the last 10 years? I learned that when the debt of the US grew, here was the cumulative distribution of the privately held public debt. We start in 2005 with this debt, that is the area below this curve. We're in 2015 with the area below this curve, a huge increase in the public debt that's privately held. I learned that when the debt increases, it also gets much shorter. When the area increased, the slope of this became much higher. Countries, including not just developed con developing countries, in which this was very common, but also developed countries, when your debt starts growing a lot, your maturity of your debt tends to shorten. What that implies is that the, because the maturity tends to shorten, it is very hard to inflate away that debt. If you go and measure the expected inflation that's relevant in the sense of the one that would defl inflate away that debt, you find that very little change, it stays very anchored. Why? It is very hard to inflate away short-term debt. Why? 
If a debt is six months old, it, it's for the next six months, you need inflation over the next six months to inflate it away. If inflation only comes a year from now, that's much too late. The debt is matured by then. As a result, I've learned that if I measure some value at risk probabilities of inflating the debt for the US, I end up with very, very small numbers in terms of the amount that the US can inflate away its debt as a result of having very short-term debt. But then I look not just at this past experience, at this inability of the US today to inflate away its debt, and I look at history to look at whenever, whenever, central whenever countries had difficulty inflating away the debt and had a lot of debt and had even more difficulty raising tax revenue to pay for the debt, they engaged in financial repression. That is, they taxed the banks or they forced the banks to turn their lovely six-month debt into a 60-year debt that will inflate away over the next 60 years. Macroprudential regulation very quickly becomes financial repression. That is a way to force the financial system to have its liabilities inflated away. Once the central bank is no longer independent and the treasury has gained back control, what it seemed like lovely regulation tools are nothing but a way to tax the banking sector and by and the depositors in the banking sector. The U.S. history on this is quite striking. When the U.S. decided to, in the 1970s, inflate some of its debt away, better even, financially repress its banks, it also approved Regulation Q after the banks lobbied that said that they didn't need to pay, they did not need to pay interest on their deposits, so all the losses the banks had were passed on to the poor depositors who, with inflation of 8%, earned 0% on their checking accounts. Jim Tobin, famous, I think not so famously, not appreciated, was on top of this as early as 1970, noting how the U.S. had basically inflated the most vulnerable, had paid its wartime debt by hurting the most vulnerable members of its society, the ones that only had checking accounts as opposed to other forms of investment. Final point. I'm f three minutes over, so I'll be seven minutes over, I think, by the time I end. Fiscal headwinds and tailwinds. What I've learned in the last seven years is that economists love to measure the government purchases multiplier, DYDG. If I just build a bridge and spend a million in it, how much would output go up? This is a love affair that started with Keynes, who first started talking about this. And, as was, and this has fed hundreds of research because being a partial derivative, it's very important what is it that you control for. Current debt, current taxes, future taxes, current spending of different types today, tomorrow, in the future, expectation of them, and so on. And so there's an infinite number of government purchase multipliers that you can use. And this unfortunately occupies an enormous amount of attention. Less attention is put on the fact that all I care about is how output changes, delta y, and that is equal to the multiplier to how much g changes. And a fact of every OECD country is that even as we engage in huge fiscal expansions in the last, in response to the crisis, almost none of them come with a delta G. In the US, this is the delta G. There's no delta G. Keynes talked about building bridges. That's not what governments do. Governments don't build bridges anymore. Obama struggled to find a bridge to build. This was doing the IRA, but give me a bridge, bring me the shovel ready projects. And so here we are spending all this energy in the UIDG when all of this is delta G, really. Much more attention should go to delta Y, delta T, transfers. That's what changes when we go into recession, not the delta G. Moreover, the tyranny of the multipliers not only tyrannized research in economics, it's tyrannized also um, policy insofar as too many policymakers fall into the fallacy. A high multiplier does not mean that fiscal policy will be more active. Again, my, some of the students here who have suffered through um, intermediate macro will know that if we have a very active monetary policy, then we'll end up with price setters updating prices more often, a steeper Phillips curve, and that's a lower multiplier monetary policy. Revert that as well. If the Phillips curve is very flat, that doesn't mean that monetary policy can be very powerful in an active systematic way, because if it's active and systematic, the Phillips curve will stop being flat. It's a fallacy to go from multipliers to active policy, as, as many have taught us. Instead, systematic policy consists not of these delta Gs, discretionary delta Gs. They don't exist. Keynes dreamed about them. They were true in 1930. There's no discretionary delta G. It's not about multipliers. 
It's rather about systematic fiscal policy. And there's three types of systematic fiscal policy. What I will call active policy that says, hey, in a recession, we should raise the deficit by X percent. If you want, akin to a Taylor rule. Whenever the output gap raises by 3 percent, we increase the deficit by 3 percent times a coefficient of, say, 1. That's different from deficit policy. Oh, sorry, it isn't because I said. So, so this is raising the total spending. A different policy, which I'll call deficit policy, is given the debt f after engaging in, say, active fiscal policy, how quickly do you pay for it? How quickly do you revert the debt back to its level? Okay? How quickly do you engage, how much, in UK terms, you engage in austerity after a big fiscal expansion? How aggressive should that be? A third form of systematic policy is the automatic stabilizers. That is, what rules are there in the micro tax and transfer systems that provide social insurance by redistribution, unemployment insurance, a progressive tax system, that happen to, as a result of recessions, grow in size whenever we're in a recession? Okay? These are different types of fiscal policy. What I've learned is that, first, a more generous system, in the sense of one that redistributes more, is one in which, when a recession hits, because people suffer or are exposed to less risk, they're less afraid of losing their job, they therefore do not save as a response to the recession, and as a result do not enhance the recession through a paradise of thrift through their precautionary savings. And I have learned that when monetary policy is constrained, fiscal policy is very useful, but especially the stabilizers. Why? Because by reducing the risk, they imply that because agents are less inclined to save as much, that will tend to push the equilibrium real interest rate and make the zero lower bound less likely. Therefore, when we talk about conventional independence and links to fiscal policy, first, going back to the dividend flows to the Treasury to follow a rule with no room for discretion, with fiscal support, and again to repeat, no room for discretion, treaties. Second, that the central bank should forcibly restate its independence in macroprudential policy, because macroprudential policy becomes financial repression very quickly when the government needs to pay its debt. And finally that, and here I'll quote the new president of the New York Fed, John Williams, that a solution to the zero lower bound problem is to design stronger, more predictable systematic adjustments, not multipliers, not discretionary policy, but especially stronger automatic stabilizers. Why? Partly because they make the zero lower bound less likely by raising equilibrium real interest rates. To conclude, it's a good thing, the end is near, that's a good thing. <laughs> I've, I'll summarize by saying that I think the new conventional monetary policy should be one in which balance sheet policy should be about targeting the satiation reserves, focusing QE on composition, not on quantities, being mindful of income risks, clarifying the fiscal support. Liquidity policy that not only we need the old budget standing um, for liquidity facilities, we need liquidity facilities for global banks, the swap lines. Interest rate policy can continue to target short-term rates. That's worked very well. But when the interest rates get zero, let's start thinking about new theories. Play with the remuneration. Let's have longer-term targets for uh, long-term interest rate targets and others. And independence, be mindful, as central bankers are getting very excited about doing more and more macroprudential regulation, be mindful of history. That regulation becomes repression when there's a need for funds. And support, as opposed to talk about fiscal headwinds and tailwinds, and perpetuate this discussion of multiplying discretionary policy. Talk instead about why we should have a better safety net, stronger automatic stabilizers, because those will both make uh, zero lower bound hit less often, as well as stabilize automatically. We've learned much about monetary policy, and none of these things, as much as they're informed by academic research, are, I think, infeasible or unrealistic, given what we've learned in the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a couple minutes for, uh, for Q&A. So um, we want to combine questions. And then please wait until you get the microphone from one of the stewards so everybody can hear your question. You point, I'm tired. Anybody wants to start? <coughs> so, I'm Savannah over here. Thanks for a great lecture, Ricardo. Um, so you mentioned that the inflation seems to 
follow this exogenous process and related to um, what you teach your students. And I think a key result in, um, you know, you can prove very easily that even if you have a very steep Phillips curve, a structural Phillips curve or aggregate supply relationship, if you have a monetary authority, a central bank that is targeting inflation, that's precisely what you will get, that, you know, inflation will be at a target of around 2% and you won't find empirically a correlation with uh, those fundamentals. And uh, um, so it's an identification issue. Um, it doesn't mean that there's no um, Phillips curve underlying it. Um, the second question I have quickly on digitalization. If the central bank is the one uh, holding all the deposits from the public, who's going to do the intermediation? I mean, we the whole point of having banks is that they are very good at, us or we think they are better than the central bank at assessing uh, risks in loans and uh, do, do a better job at, uh, than, than a central bank would. Nobody has a question, maybe, maybe I can ask the second question. I got a little bit worried about uh, the second Hall Rice theorem about uh, the, the probability one event. Um, so I think at the conclusions you, you said is that you know, the government just has to you know, commit to make up the losses. But so if, that, if you don't think that that's very realistic, should we be very worried about the second Hall Rice theorem? Sure, let me answer those two questions. So first, on Silvana's question on the, uh, um, so as I said, the experience of the last few years has made me be less confident in what I learned. It hasn't told me that what I learn or what I teach is wrong, for partly for the reasons that you said, which is that I don't think there's decisive evidence that the Phillips curve has collapsed, or that rules versus discretion as determined inflation targets is no longer correct, or that the public debt cannot lead to high inflations and the end of central bank independence. I don't think the last 10 years have taught me that any of those are necessarily wrong. But I also think that they've questioned a little bit how confident I am in any of these statements. So it's true that, focusing just on the Phillips curve, I think one can tell certainly accounts that say that, well, the Phillips curve, it was a success of the central bank in pitting down inflation that meant that, ultimately, if you want in the Phillips curve, again, an econometric way of putting it is that if you really target inflation, when I go and regress on employment on inflation, like this gentleman did here, if inflation is a constant, the R square is going to be zero, because you just set inflation to zero. So that's another way to state your question. I think that's correct. At the same time, you weren't that successful controlling inflation. Inflation did go up a little bit up and down. We estimated, and it's very, the Phillips curve slope seems to have changed in, in those ways. We look at the fundamentals behind the Phillips curve, and there seems to have been, there was enough inflation shocks in terms of commodity prices, there was enough shifts in the Phillips curve, we see almost no change whatsoever in expected inflation. All those are consistent, but none of those is enough for me to reject the Phillips curve or any other theory. They're enough for me to question them a little more and to be not quite as confident as I was in the past on them. On intermediation, note that we think of the intermediation of banks comes from collecting offering short-term deposits that pay an interest rate and making with them long-term loans or risky investments that pay also a risky interest rate and then in between the two in a competitive market making zero profit or making at least just not too large of a profit, let's put it that way. Um, offering a digital account of the Bank of England would always by definition pay only the interest on reserves, that deposit rate, that deposit rate would always be below the deposit that Barclays would offer for you for a checking account, precisely because they're making profits on the intermediation. The difference is you can now have an option to deposit in a narrow bank called the Bank of England, the zero intermediation, and thus pays you peanuts, or deposit at Barclays, who's going to take on risk, engage in material transformation, and paying you a little bit more than peanuts. As a result, this in principle will not affect your ability to the ability of banks to intermediate it will, in principle, will not affect the engagement of intermediation. It will just mean that that will have to be remunerated, as it is today, at a rate that's above the deposit rate on the very safe narrow bank called the Bank of England. So per se, it doesn't have to eliminate intermediation in any way, insofar as that continues to be remunerated and you'll have a bigger payment. Moreover, even if we offered deposits at the Bank of England that I could have, I would be very doubtful that the Bank of England would be able to compete with Lloyd's in the ability to track our deposits. What we know from the banking sector is that banks expend an enormous amount of resources 
paying nice models and marketing agents and opening branches in every corner just to get you to walk in the door and deposit a pound. There's some estimates that per pound that you deposit at a commercial bank, it costs them roughly three to four P just to get you in the door. The Bank of England, if it announced tomorrow we will accept deposits, I would doubt that a big fraction of the English population would move their accounts to the Bank of England queue because the Bank of England is not particularly good at hiring models to put on billboards, getting advertising agents and others. At the same time, it would allow for this to be an escape valve in the economy for if you want liquidity and you don't want to engage in the risk that comes with, it, with depositing at Barclays. A good example here is, for now 30 years, if I want to buy a US government bond, I could do it online in treasurydirect.gov. I just need to go there, put my, put my social security number, if you're a US citizen, um, link it to your bank account, takes 10 minutes, you buy a 10-year bond, you put yourself your bid on the auction, you get it, it's automatic. I've done it many times, okay? And yet, 99% of government bonds are still bought where you go to your pension fund or your <laughs> broker or your bank and say, can you please buy me a five-year government bond for me as part of my insurance plan? And you pay the margin to the broker and to the many intermediaries in that role. The fact that the Treasury 20 years ago decided to offer this very easy over the phone or online for now 15 years has not led to people stopping paying brokerage fees in buying government bonds. Quite on the contrary, there's an enormous source of revenue for banks in brokerage fees for buying government bonds, even though you had a way to go around them. To Vouter on the probability one. So I think the probability one, again, this is an almost surely as time goes to infinity result. So it's that if you have this, these losses and they never get kept, then you will for sure end up being insolvent because for sure you'll be hit by shocks. What we observed up until, say, 10 years ago in the case of the Fed, just to keep that example, was that there was no risk in their balance sheet. They had no risk because they had the short-term treasuries and the reserves. As a result, it was probability zero that they would ever suffer a net income loss. So multiplying that by the probability one, that if they had a loss, they'd be insolvent, you get a zero because zero multiplying anything is zero. And so as a result, there was no concern and this would never have arisen. Now they've taken on some risk. Now estimates of how big is that risk still show that the risk is very small and consistent with the tools we have for fiscal backing. So as a result, the Fed is still essentially fully fiscally backed because within the range of net income risks that it has, it is enough the tools and the instruments and escape valves we have in case. Moving forward though, and that was my point, if we are going to have risky balance sheets, then we have to calculate what these ranges are if you want, stress test exactly the fiscal support that they have and figure out whether those are enough or not. Because once you, become, you get outside of the bounds, then those probabilities and those dynamics would, would emerge. Great. I think it's exactly 8 o'clock. So this is a good uh, time to th thank our speaker. Thanks. Thank you.